Greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on the John Campia YouTube channel. That's right, the Designing Hollywood podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it? Especially if you love the movies. Observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder. Your Viceroy of Verisimilitude, your sommelier of sci-fi and cinema, your evangelist of the imagination, and of course the still as yet undefined existential Mr. Rogers, that's right, me, Robert Meyer Burnett. And you know, I wasn't going to do this stream necessarily, I, uh, uh, not a lot to talk about in the entertainment world, I've got some things percolating, some big stories I'm working on, big shows with very interesting topics, but tonight was not one of those nights. However, however, sometimes, you know, I got a couple of letters. As you know, right down below, www.postgeeksingularity.com. You can go to my website and you can see lots of stuff on there and uh, hasn't really been updated lately, but you can send me letters there. And uh, any, any letters, it's free of charge. And as you know, for longtime viewers of this channel, I read letters aloud, your letters, and uh, we discuss we discussed, so I let you opine. You don't have to send me a super chat. You don't have to uh, do any of that. But um, if you want to obviously interact live, you can do that too. You can either send in a tip or a super chat, whatever you want to do. But uh, the the tip uh, links in the bottom, and then, of course, there's super chats. But if you want to write me a letter, it's free of charge. Um, and uh, as long as you keep the letters fairly brief. But this was this was pretty interesting. I mean, there's nothing better on this channel that I love more than interacting with you people. What do you mean, you people? Um, I mean, you people. I mean, you, you, imagination connoisseurs, you members of this, the post geek singularity community. What I'd like to say is the best community on YouTube, and you are all imagination connoisseurs par excellence. So anyway, I'm just gonna jump right into it, and. Um, Let's just get into it. Uh, so uh, this letter comes to us from Zach Stewart. By the way, if you don't want me to read a letter, you want to send me a letter and you want to converse, that's fine. Uh, and if you don't want me to read it, just put, put please don't read this aloud. Uh, like in the subject heading or make it the first line of your letter. So I don't, I don't read it. But this one comes from Zach Stewart. And the subject and headline was feeling disconnected from my own generation, which is Generation Z. And again, this comes from Zach Stewart. Hello, Rob. I've been a lurker amongst the PGS for some time now. I felt compelled to write to you about something I've struggled with until discovering this community. First, some details about me. I am 23 and recently graduated from college and began my career in architecture. I've always been a film fan and my passion for film and fandom has grown exponentially over the years. I collect physical media. I want to collect hot toys eventually, build model kits, create art of my own, and I have an unhealthy obsession with Lego. My poor bank account. There is no such thing as an unhealthy obsession with Lego. Lego fucking rules. Rob... I feel strange amongst my generational peers, and let me tell you why. My father is to thank for the interests and hobbies I have today. You are the only other person I have seen with as much of a love and interest for Star Trek as my father. He too hates modern Trek. 
You two could be best friends, laugh out loud. Growing up, I was always watching old VHS tapes that my dad had collected. Between that gateway into film and the music I was brought up on, I feel almost out of place within my own age group. There isn't as much of an appreciation for these things amongst people my age. I don't see a true love for anything that isn't modern and fresh. Not to discredit anyone, but it saddens me that pop culture has phased out some of the greatest content and pastimes ever, at least amongst the youth of today. As I said before, this has really made me feel out of place, and I find it difficult to connect through these mediums with my own peers. My favorite film of all time is Aliens, with Ghostbusters as a close second. I grew up on this style of film, and I found a love and passion for science fiction and films of the 80s. My favorite shows that my father introduced me to over the years were the original Little Rascals show and Batman from 1966. My father and I built kits together when I was younger. I eventually started building my own, and we would go to conventions and enter in competitions. The model kits I build range from military to sci-fi and automobiles. When you mentioned Cult TV Man recently, it sparked these thoughts. I have met him at model conventions in the past, and I'm always enamored by his kits on display. That's Steve Iverson. For those of you who are interested in the very best place to go get science fiction, fantasy, uh, and horror model kits, go to Cult TV Man, C-U-L-T, TVman.com. He has everything. My father and I built kits together when I was, oh, I read that. Um, it is surreal to see that passions and interests of mine are dying off in real time. The most depressing realization I've had is that these will never last my lifetime. I almost feel like I'm an honorary member of another generation. I'm eager to hear your thoughts, and I hope to become a channel member soon and talk to you about these things more. Also, I attached a photo of a one-to-one -one scale R2-D2 that my father scratch-built out of paper. Uh, which, by the way, let me, I didn't realize this was here. I would have preloaded it, but allow me to put it up on the screen. This is, okay, this is amazing. Um, an R2 unit pre-built out of paper. Um, that is, I mean, come on. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, kind souls, gentle beings, however you identify across these, the 28 known galaxies, there is an R2-D2 made out of paper. Uh, that is absolutely outstanding. And that is made by Zach Stewart's father. Uh, to recap, Zach is 23 years old, and he recently graduated from college and became an architect, and he feels disconnected from his generation. Well, gosh, where to begin? First of all, Zach, uh, I feel you. And, and one of the things that I find strange about the world that we live in um, is when I was a kid and I, it, it was Star Trek was my gateway drug. You know, I, I, my mom says I started watching it when I was three. I started watching it when I was five. I love the original Star Trek. And at the same time, uh, Star Trek led me to other things. The Twilight Zone was one of them. So it was Star Trek, The Twilight Zone, and then I started to watch Sci-Fi Theater on Seattle's Channel 11, which was on at 2 o'clock uh, on Sundays. I would come home from Sunday school. I had to go to Sunday school. Um, I went to Sunday school at Temple D. Hirsch. I'd come home, and then I'd watch Sci-Fi Theater. And that's when I saw my favorite movie for the first time, which was my favorite movie when I was about 5, 6, 7, 8, uh, until Star Wars came out, was War of the Worlds. Byron Haskins' War of the Worlds. By the way, tonight, true story, uh, thanks to Kino Lorber, they sent me the Outer Limits box sets or the the, the seasons one and two, and I watched I watched the Architects of Fear um, that uh, uh, Alan uh, Moore drew upon when he when he when he wrote Watchmen. Um, but I would watch Outer Limits as well. And uh, here was the thing: when I when I was a kid, I it it didn't matter. Like you you mentioned Little Rascals when I was going to school in the mornings they were playing little rascal shorts it's like 7 a.m we'd get up we'd have breakfast and we would watch spanky darla alfalfa buckwheat and the gang um 
And, uh, you know, those were from the 30s. And I watched those before I went to school. And then I'd come home and watch sitcoms, Leave it to Beaver, I Dream of Jeannie, Gilligan's Island, Partridge Family, Brady Bunch, My Three Sons, whatever. But you would watch sitcoms from the seven, the, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. And, and Our Gang shorts in the 30s. So in one day, I was being exposed to decades of American pop culture. And I never thought to myself once, I'm like, well, I'm not going to watch this because it's black and white. Uh, Our Gang shorts were just black and white. They just, that's how they were. Twilight Zone, Outer Limits, they were black and white. Uh, old movies like War of the Worlds, they were in color. The first Godzilla movie was in black and white. Rodan, which is still... I think my favorite kaiju movie of all time was color as well. Um, I didn't make any distinction. I would watch anything that had anything at all to do with science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Didn't matter. Uh, seeing Planet of the Apes for the first time, I've told the story many times on this channel, changed my life. I didn't know what it was. Um, but here was the thing. At that time, we lived in a world where I, even as a kid, was looking outside myself. I was looking outward. Um, I was looking at flights of fancy. I was looking at imagination. I was looking at, at books. And, you know, when Star Wars came out, it led me to start listening to classical music because of the soundtrack. And I was always, I, I, it, it made me a seeker. You know, Star Trek, boldly go. Well, I kind of took that to heart in my own life. You know, boldly go out there and, Learn all that is learnable and uh, make yourself a better person because there was something to be discovered wherever you went. And I think nowadays, because of social media and communications technology, I think things have shifted. I don't think people really are looking out anymore. I think they're looking at themselves. That's what social media has allowed you to do. It has allowed you to go out into the world, put yourself out in the world, and you get all this feedback from the world. And I think one of the problems with that is that people are enamored too much of themselves and not in an egomaniacal sort of a way, but just they truly are the star of their own show. And for me, I always wanted, I wanted to push outward and, and go forward. And now I see people, um, it's all, look what I'm doing right now. I mean, I'm talking on YouTube, but for me, what's what's interesting about social media and YouTube and as like I have been speaking at, at science fiction conventions for 25, over 25 years. And for me, it was it's this this channel. And I think what people respond to those that like and subscribe and are members is I'm interested in, in sharing, seeking, talking to you, reading your letters. And here's the thing. I don't think that you should worry about being disconnected from your generation because what you seem to know is what the most important thing is, you know about yourself. Don't worry about what people like or what people don't like. Embrace what you like. I mean, that's really all that matters. And it sounds like your father brought you up well. I mean, model kits, hell. I just got my final parts for my four and a half foot long space battleship Andromeda, all 60 issues of the part works so I can build that sucker. Um, and I'm not going to apologize to anyone and no one's even, no one I know even knows what it is. It's going to be, I mean, the thing is huge. It is huge. It's die cast in plastic. It's going to be amazing. It lights up sound effects. It's got remote control. Everything, the guns move. It's so rad. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> the thing is, don't worry about what other people think. Don't worry about being disconnected from your generation. What you need to worry about is being connected with yourself. And 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 listen, that doesn't mean I don't mean to say reject anybody. Don't 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 do that. But love what you love. You know, I, it sounds silly to say. I mean, everyone says it, but you do you. Here's the thing. I find it unfortunate that we are surrounded. We have more technology right now. If I had this technology when I was 12 years old, man, would it have been terrific. I would have been, I would have been directing movies at 15. We now have all of this incredible technology. And, and if you are a seeker, if you are somebody that is interested in the world, 
the technology at your disposal, the information at your disposal is limitless. And um, if you're a fan, there's never been a better time. Um, the problem is, you know, we were now living, it's an evolutionary process. Social media is relatively new. Right now we're in the phase where everyone is kind of looking back at themselves. They've put themselves at the center of their own reality show. Um, and I understand that. The Vim Vendors, who made Wings of Desire, which is one of my favorite movies of all time, he made a movie called Until the End of the World. And in that film, there's a device where people could record their dreams when they were sleeping. And when they wake up, they could watch their dreams. And it became almost, it became addictive. What, what would be more fascinating than to be able to watch your own dreams played back on a screen that you could watch? And it was kind of like a narcotic. People became addicted to that idea. It wasn't that they were bad people, but it was just that, you know, you're looking at something like right now. I've watched all these videos about AI art, and here's all the prompts you can use. Well, we're going to have to get over that because all AI art is, you've got AI scrubbing the internet and taking an amalgamation of all everybody else's work, and then you get fed back images that, yes, you came up with the idea, you wrote in a line of code, and then you got all these great images back. But at the end of the day, I hope that doesn't last because... Um, it's you're not you're not creating anything. You're just telling an AI to take stuff that other people created and mash it up and give it back to you. But I, I know it's it's addictive because you know you have an idea, you punch it in, you get back these images. It's like a narcotic. I understand it, but the thing is, don't worry about things that are going to die out. Model building. You talk about model building. I love model spaceships. Cult TV man. I buy. I have. A lot of models, a lot of unbuilt, as any model builder has, a lot of unbuilt models. I mean, what is it? this, this right here, uh, this is an Estes model rocket. It's uh, It flies on a E engine, it's an Interceptor E. This was one of my favorite model rockets when I was in elementary school. And then they reissued it like, I don't know, 15 years ago. And um, I, I love this rocket, the Interceptor. Just not the satellite Interceptor, it's just the Interceptor. And I... I love it. It was my one of my favorite rockets, and I had to build it. I built it, you know, made out of balsa wood, cardboard. But um, no, I mean, I don't. I don't even know anybody that flies model rockets anymore. But there is a vibrant model rocketry community, and people are buying or making rockets that go. I mean, somebody built a one to one scale model of this and fired it off. It was insane. Um, but there will always be communities of people whether it's music, Lego, whatever. There's always people out there that are going to be fishing autos of all this stuff. So don't worry about that. What you should worry about is is go out into the world, love what you love, and make the most of yourself. You know, just enjoy. The, the universe is a fantastic place. I mean, despite all the horror that humanity re- visits upon itself, um, you can live a life of awe and wonder. And I would say you're well on your way. Uh, I I would not worry at all. You've got a great head on your shoulders, man. And um, I think, Zach, hold on to what you love and, and, and love it fiercely and never let anyone tell you not to and go out and be a great architect, realize whatever it is you want to realize because there's never been a better time. The problem is it takes hard work and perseverance as anything does. The one, I think the biggest casualty of the modern age is people want to, they just want to get to their destination and social media tends to make people believe that they can uh, without doing the work. And there's a lot of work to be done. And that is, that is, um, that's all part of it. So I would say, don't worry about it, man. Just love what you love. Do what you do. Take it all in. Go boldly, and I know these these are just stupid platitudes, but look, put your nose to the grindstone, work hard at what you want to be, and um, I'll tell you something. You never know if you if you love, if you have interests that you really love, you have no idea where that love will take you, where you will wind up with that. I will tell you this. the I know this. If you don't do the work and you don't go out, if you don't boldly go, nothing will ever happen to you. 
You have to go out. You have to go out. You have to be a part. You have to be a citizen of the world because I, you never know what's going to happen. You never know what's going to happen when you are out there doing what you love, enjoying yourself, being a part of that, whatever community you want to be a part of. You just never know. Opportunity will find you. I guarantee it. So I want to thank you for writing the letter. And uh, it's a great letter. Uh, this, let's see, Angelo uh, Guida, I think it's Guida, Angelo Guida writes in and says, Rob is great, this is the subject of his letter, Rob is great, but there are issues with the community. Hello Rob, my name is Angelo, and I'm from Montana. I've been a subscriber to your channel for some time now, and I very much enjoy the show. I'm writing in response to what went down with Matt Jarbo calling you a racist. Um, now, I should give some context here. A couple weeks back, uh, and I went to a The Empire Strips Back, a Star Wars burlesque show at the Ricardo Montalban Theater in Hollywood. And before that show started, I went to the Frolic Room on Hollywood Boulevard, a very famous bar, and in that bar... Uh, I met Chris Gore, I met Gary, Nerdrotic, uh, Polly, the Latino Slant channel, and um, we all hung out. And Polly took a picture of all of us, and put it was put on Twitter. And I thought it was great. Bunch of guys, bunch of fellow YouTube pundits, streamers, and all of these things. And um, we put a picture there. And I mean, I don't really know. I know Matt Jarbo's been on the internet for over a decade. I don't really know much about him. I think I streamed with him like once in a big stream, but I don't, you know, know him. But he clearly, obviously, when this picture went up, he came after me, uh, as people do. See, I don't really play that game. Like, I make it a policy not really to go after YouTubers because everybody I know in the YouTube space is first and foremost a fan. I remember, you know, I streamed a couple years back with Jeremy from Geeks and Gamers, and I thought, you know, we had a great conversation. And um, the whole reason this channel exists is to promote the idea of discourse, of of communication. And I, I have known many people in my life, people I've liked, people I haven't liked. But I've, I think one of my attributes is I can have a conversation with anybody. Um, but I'll tell you something. While my fellow streamers, obviously as uh, Heel versus Babyface, I've done some great streams with him. I really like Az. We've done toy streams. We did prisoner streams. We did squid game review streams. Now, there's a lot of things that Az does online that, you know, it's, I'd say more of it's it's performance or whatever, but but I love Az. He's, I, I, I really enjoy streaming with him. I think we've done a lot of great work. I like Gary. I really like Critical Drinker. We've done some great streams, but a lot of people... Uh, paint them with a brush that I think is not correct. But anyway, that that's where this 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 came from. This picture got put up of all of us having a good time at the frolic room, and suddenly people started calling me a racist. Okay, so that's you got the context. Um, so I'm writing a response. Let me get back to this. This is Angelo uh, Guida from Montana who says, I'm writing in response to what went down with Matt Jarbo calling you a racist. You, sir, are indeed not a racist. You are a kind soul who welcomes all. Your discussions are great, and you provide weight to every conversation. You are a well of geek knowledge that is vital to the online community, and thank you for being here. I sadly must say to you something that has been bothering me tremendously about a certain community in fandom, and I hope to hear your input. This community consists of Gary... Critical Drinker, Midnight's Edge, or anyone like them. I'm not a fan of the everything I see is woke and I hate it group of people that are online. I do not believe they help or add anything to fandom, just adding more discourse. I hate scrolling through my YouTube feed and coming upon thumbnails of photoshopped actors with red laser eyes and sad faces. It's absolutely ridiculous. What does that say about us as a community? They love to root for things to fail, and they attack things before they even have a chance to see them. Oh, I know that because I am uh, out on a limb here. 
about Terry Metalis's Picard season three, which I loved. I think it's a, a huge return to form for Star Trek. And I think anybody who tunes in, especially if you're a Next Generation fan, you're going to love what you see. Uh, I think it's a beautifully written show. And uh, sure, people might say it's Star Trek's greatest hits. But so what? It's a 10-hour star. It's the, the best Star Trek The Next Generation movie we never got uh, told over 10 hours. And I love it. And uh, boy, people are... <laughs> I'm out on a limb. But hey, I'm not going to apologize for what I love. I never do. Um... Some say they're putting on a persona, that they're not like that in real life. The outrage gets the clicks if it gets them views, and I find nothing genuine about that. When I'm online, I'm looking for genuine conversations. I have seen vids from Nerd Roddick and Midnight's Edge just to hear them out, and it's not my cup of tea. I remember the days my friends and I would walk out of a theater and we asked each other if it was a good movie or not. Now, these days, it's all about if a movie was woke or not. Uh, if it had an agenda or what some actors said on social media. I never even heard the word woke until a few years ago, and I never met a person claiming to be woke. Now it's a buzzword thrown out by people in the community and the Republican Party. What are these people's deals? When I don't like something, I say my piece and I move on with my life. I do not jump on YouTube and consistently talk about it. To be hateful about something is exhausting and a waste of someone's life. So, Rob, what do you think? Is this a problem uh, in the community, or is my take on them too hard? I'm sure they are good people who just want to watch good content. Keep up the good work, and thank you for all that you do. You are a prime example of someone who is genuine. Listen, man, uh, first of all, I want to thank you, Angela, for writing in. And, you know, it's a good question. But I would say, I would say this. We now live in a time where a lot of the stories that we grew up with, obviously, look, movies and TV are commercial propositions. They are products that are being made by companies to sell to audiences to make money. There, There is no, I don't think that we should have any illusions about any of that. However, what has changed in the world is that, for instance, when George Lucas made American Graffiti for Universal, and it ended up, uh, uh, it, it, the, believe me, the people at Universal when American Graffiti came out in, what, 73? They didn't think the movie was going to be a hit. It was a monster hit. The, the, the album sales of the soundtrack, all the songs on the soundtrack, those early 60s songs, late 50s songs, huge hit. George Lucas, the new golden boy of Hollywood after he'd made THX 1138 that Warner Brothers hated. So he made uh, American Graffiti. Nobody wanted to make it. Uh, Star Wars. He, he wanted to do Star Wars. He wanted to do Flash Gordon. He wanted to do Flash Gordon, couldn't get the rights, then he was going to do Star Wars. Universal, that he just made a ton of money for, did not, did not want to make it. Only Alan Ladd Jr. over at 20th Century Fox wanted to make it. But, you know, it was a risk. A studio would green light a creator's movie, or they would generate it internally and fi- hire somebody to do it. But it was basically turned over to the creatives. It, a creative wanted to make a movie, then they would get into a partnership with the studio and the movie would come out or they get, it would get made and hopefully it would sell. Now, what has happened is the Star Wars that one man wanted to make, George Lucas, um, ha- is now owned by a corporation. It's owned by Disney. And I think, if you think about it, um, it's not like Nerd Rotic or Midnight's Edge. And by the way, I've streamed a lot with Tom and Andre from Midnight's Edge. And um, I've made a lot of friends uh, with those guys, and I really like them. And they have done... I was actually a fan of their channel before I even knew any of them, before I started streaming on YouTube. I really like a lot of their in-depth analysis of, of subjects. But I think if you really look... Our, are, is there a lot of bullshit that you have to wade through that people have to, you know, people are talking smack? And sh- yes. But if you really listen, sure, you might be turned off by the delivery. But if you really listen to a lot of these, like Critical Drinker, I think, has a, a great takes on story. A lot of people don't like, uh, again, he has a character. But Critical Drinker in real life is a novelist. And he's, he's uh, got books out there that you can buy and read. But if you really listen to his channel, 
um, and you listen to Gary and Midnight's Edge and a lot of these channels, they're all asking for the same thing, the same thing that I'm asking for, which are great stories well told. And what has happened is the corporations now that are controlling our favorite stories that used to belong to their individual creators, and you know they don't. The creators are either no longer with us. The corporations now that are making these these entertainments have agendas. The first agenda is they want to make money. The second agenda is they have to tailor these IPs to suit their um, uh, needs. So when um, Star Wars is being created, Disney decides, okay, we want to make a new Star Wars movie. Let's get the creator du jour to come on board to do it. And then they have an agenda. They have to have, okay, we, we want to have a female lead. We want to have all these, these, these boxes that they have to check. What has happened in a lot of the storytelling is that we are getting bad stories. And I think whether you like certain YouTube creators, um, everyone is sort of responding to the same problem in different ways. And that is we are getting bad stories that are made by, I heard this great term, I can't, I can't stop thinking about it, made by fraudulent creators who are, of course, there to make money. Look, I'll give you an example. I've never met J.J. Abrams. But when he first made, and he's going to get to direct Star Trek IV probably, but um, when he made Star Trek uh, 2009, he never hesitated to tell everyone that was interviewing him that he didn't like Star Trek. He didn't like it growing up. And, and to me, if you don't have a passion, a guy like J.J. Abrams was not passionate about Star Trek, I, I would call that a fraud. He's a fraudulent creator. And he wanted to make it about business and all that. There was no, sure, he wanted to make a good movie, but you could have given him any movie to direct and he would turn it into a good movie. Or maybe not. I don't think he's a particularly good film director. I've watched five of his science fiction movies and hated all five of them. Um, and uh, uh, he's a fraudulent creator. He gets paid a hell of a lot of money. He had a $500 million deal with Warner Brothers. And what came out of that? $500 million. Someone gave me $500 million. Let me tell you, I would know what I was doing for the next 10 years. I would have projects not in development. I would have projects going into pre-pro in a month because I have enough projects I want to make. I would know what I would want to make. But the, the problem is we live in a world where all of these stories that are being shoved down our throats are are disingenuous stories on many different levels. And look, I understand what's happening is this is there there are definitely agendas that are driving Here's the thing, from my perspective, and I always go back to someone like Spike Lee. I remember seeing his movie She's Got to Have It, which is a movie about a, a woman in New York, multiple a, a black woman who has she's navigating her life and her relationships, she's dating multiple dudes. Nothing about that movie was necessarily in my wheelhouse. I loved it. When I saw it, did I mind it was about a black woman who was the protagonist? No. I was seeing a culture in terms of I always wanted to live in New York and Brooklyn and all. I loved New York movies growing up, but I was from Seattle. So when I first saw that movie, it didn't matter who or what. It didn't matter whether it was about a woman. It didn't matter whether it was a person of color. It didn't matter what it was was a great story well told by an emerging voice. And it was genuine. It had a true authorship. And I think all of us, that's what we're looking for. We all want true authorship. I don't believe that any of these creators, any of these YouTube creators, content creators, I don't believe that Gary, I don't believe that Midnight's Edge, I don't believe that Doomcock, I don't believe that Jeremy from Geeks and Gamers, I don't believe that any of them are racists or misogynists. I really don't. I think they all want the same thing. They want great stories well told, but they are pushing back against the nature of fraudulent creation. But they're just doing it, in a, they're doing it in a crass, loud way that I think is a lot of the time, yeah, is can it be childish or puerile? Sure. 
And and I get it because a lot of the time, if you look at a lot of these YouTube shows, why is Gary so popular? Because it's like hanging out with your friends at the bar. You watch Friday Night Tights, and I dip in there, and it's it's it is like showing up at a bar and hanging out. And and I I think I've been on that show twice, and everybody was very respectful to me and nice. But a lot of you might not all like all the language, and people might be mean or whatever. But I'll tell you something. All of it, and I think it's to a large extent the rest of our culture. Look, there's a lot of I do not like the hatred and the disrespect. There is a fundamental lack of respect that everyone has for everyone else. Look, even me, I'm I, I, as people have said in these letters that I'm level headed. I go on to, to Twitter and I talk about my love of Star Trek Picard season three, and everybody's like jumping all over me and they tell me, Well, I'm not going to watch this. I'm like, Look, man. Whether you like season three of Picard or not, you have, if you love Star Trek The Next Generation, I guarantee you're going to dig it, if only to see the characters come back, and they're all really well written, and I think the acting is some of the best all of them have ever done, and it's got a really interesting story and everything, but I get it. I mean, people have been, we're supposed to like Doctor Who's Timeless Children, you know, where, where it looks like the stories, here's the big problem. The stories themselves have been compromised and they've been compromised by fraudulent creators and companies that are more interested in pushing whatever their agenda is and yeah, besides making money. And that's what I think all of this is, is all about. And as we see, first of all, bad storytelling doesn't sell. And what we're, we're seeing is, is uh, that that has happened, and a lot of these franchises have been damaged by creators that got these jobs that didn't necessarily deserve them. And then once you get hired by a company, you, you have to do their bidding as well. So I understand that, and I think remember, I think a lot of us. I mean, look, I grew up going to science fiction conventions, and we used to get knocked down, drag out arguments about how warp drive works or how time travel. No, you don't know how time travel works. I got in those arguments my whole life. So I think that what people are responding to, and I, I'll tell you something, I see things coming around. I see the pendulum is beginning to swing another way. And I think, look, like it or not, when you see a creator, we all want creators that are genuine. Whether you like James Cameron's world of Avatar, you got to give it up. No one can do a movie like James Cameron can, whether he's doing Terminator, Aliens, or now Avatar, he is not a fraudulent creator. He is a creator that's giving it all, giving it his all. And when you go see a movie like Way of Water, you might not love it. You might love it. I quite enjoyed it. You're getting a true storyteller telling you the story he wants to tell you in the manner he chose to tell you that story in. That's all that we all want. And we have been getting a lot of very cynically created terrible stories that are part of IPs that people have loved. And and it it has been very frustrating to be a fan of some of these things because the level of the level of pandering to the audience on a number of different levels has quite frankly to me been shocking. On the other hand, you know, I like to see new creators come into the space with different perspectives. And I think we do need more people of color. We do need more female. We do need more LGBTQ. Call it what you want. We need more creators with different perspectives. As long as they're true to the stories they're telling, that's what I want. Great stories, well told. That's all with great, I, I want great characters and great stories. Genuine characters, genuine storytelling. Whatever messaging should that is is in these stories should be built into the DNA of the characters and the and the stories that you're telling. You can never win putting your universe first, putting your agenda first, pulling your putting your political messaging first. You'll never win because your stories won't be good. And while maybe everyone's delivery is not your cup of tea, and I understand that. I mean. I, I would like to dial down a lot of the discourse, and I think that there is a lot of, um, you know, a lot of, lot of noise out there. But at the end of the day, 
I do not apologize with people that I'm friends with. And I mean, people are trying to call out my friendship with Brian Singer. I'm like, I've known Brian Singer for over 30 years. I've worked on four movies with him. I've done great documentary work for him. He's hired me on X-Men, on X-Men 2, on Superman Returns, and got me my first single, my first uh, solo producing documentary uh, documentaries for uh, Usual Suspects. Now, he's never been convicted of a crime. And um, uh, the guy, if, if, if I ever needed help, I could call him up and he would help me. And I know that. And so, um, you know, here's the thing. People should be themselves not worried so much about what other people are doing, but more worried about what they themselves are doing. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's... But I understand where you're coming from, Angelo. We have to, and I said this, the manifesto that I put out two days ago, I said, we all need to be better. And, and here's the thing. You know, it's so funny. I get all this pushback. Well, fans, creators, I'm like, look, man, creators don't owe really anybody anything except I would hope great characters and great stories. Now you might not like all of that, but what I don't like, what I don't like, uh, when I was growing up, you know, we'd go to the movies and we'd hope things were good, but if something wasn't good, you're like, ah, that, that was, that was disappointing. It was a bummer, but the vitriol, the problem is now the stories that we're getting, so many of them are not genuine. And that's what people are responding to in various ways. And I think that, you know, what did Yoda say? Uh, anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. You know, whatever. Paraphrasing there. But but um, that's what I think we should do for all, all of 2023. We have to elevate the discourse, ratchet down the hatred. I mean, people hate me they, they because I like Star Trek Picard Season 3. I hated Picard Seasons 1 and 2. I was over the moon. To see Star Trek, and by the way, anybody who's a Star Trek fan, I don't have to tell you. You'll know. You'll you'll watch the first episode and go, oh. Just the character interplay between Riker and Picard alone. It's like, oh, Patrick Stewart's no longer playing Patrick Stewart. He's actually back playing Jean-Luc Picard. So anyway, um, I just wanted to um, well, thank you for writing in, Angelo. Now, there's been some people who... Um, our friend uh, Sonny Dominguez, the, the king of squirting, Sonny Dominguez sends in a tip and says, Hollywood has drastically changed fandom to be acceptable due to its pop cultural appeal. However, storytellers who give a different take on a hero often overlook the ideals that originally resonated with fans. They should be held accountable. No? Sonny, I totally agree. 100%. That's the thing. They get these creators. That's why J.J. Abrams, ah, I don't really, I never liked Star Trek. Then why are you making a Star Trek movie? You know, and what, here, here I'll give you an example because Star Trek for me is the easiest example. This is the problem in a nutshell. So the people that, Alex Kurtzman and the people that make Star Trek Discovery, all the writers, Michelle Paradise, all these people, they decide, okay, we're going we're gonna to bring on Captain Pike and Spock. Because, hey, these are marquee characters from Star Trek's history. But they didn't create these characters. The, as a matter of fact, Spock and Pike go all the way back to the cage, which was the rejected pilot for Star Trek that was made in 1965. But what do these people do? They saddle Spock with a... They give, him, they give this character a learning disability, and then they saddle him with a, 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 a sister no one's ever heard of that made him the man he is today. So they take a beloved character that was not created by them and and they change that character to be more appealing to I don't know who. We're going to give him a learning disability to make um, him more appealing to who? People that have learning disabilities here? The thing is, Spock was a character that already was beloved and had great appeal. And you don't have to denigrate the character by saddling, I'm, I'm not saying having a learning disability is bad, but what you've done is you've taken a quick and easy and a pandering way to change, fundamentally change a character that isn't yours to change. You didn't create the character, and what you're doing is that's a thing that, that becomes, today it's fashion, but oh, let's saddle. Well, anybody who's been a Star Trek fan knows that 
The point of the character of Spock is that he is a man of two worlds. And the problem is, as a Vulcan, he was compromised. He was compromised amongst his own people because he was half human. So he had to be better. And in a way, Spock represents the immigrant experience when you come to Earth, uh, come to uh, America. You know, immigrants had to be better. They were people of two worlds. There's many things that Spock represented. You don't have to give him a learning disability to make him appeal to, I don't know, why would you do that? That was the kind of choice. And we see all of our entertainment uh, infected with that kind of, it, that's bad storytelling. And it's a fundamental lack. First of all, it's a lack of respect of the character. I'm not saying you can't put the character, give the character new um, adventures. But the people that made Star Trek Discovery were doing things to that character that denigrated that character at the expense of the characters that they had created, like someone like Michael Burnham. And um, that's why people get angry. That's why I get angry. That's one of the reasons I was watching that show, and I'm like, F this show. Who are you to do this to this character? And it shows a fundamental lack of understanding of what the character of Spock represents. And it's also bad writing because, oh, wait, you can, you can take, you can give any character in any show a learning disability. And the real question is in a Star Trek context, what does, how do you, how do you do that? You know, you create a new character and, and you have a story where a learning disability is integral to the plot. So anyway. Um, anyway, Angela, I want to thank you for your letter and Sonny. Thank you as always. Sheriff Carl, Sheriff Carl sends in a tip and says, one day I want to tell you about the 30th Star Wars celebration in Germany where I got drunk with Tim Rose who performed Admiral Akbar. I asked him about his work with Jim Henson and I got a glorious tale of Muppets, cocaine, and the French authorities. And it was metal as fuck. Well, Sheriff Carl, one day I'm going to come up to the P and W and uh, I'm going to hear that story, and I can't wait to hear it right from you. Let's see. There's people who've been firing in in super chats. Um, let's get to those super chats. RRTNZ says, "Happy New Year, Rob." Well, Happy New Year to you. Don't know why folks giving you grief for liking Picard season three, having not seen it themselves. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> I've seen it. We may disagree. Oh, after I've seen it, we may disagree, but I know you're giving your genuine view. Cheers. Yeah, I think that's another thing. I mean, people know on this channel, that's all I ever do is give my genuine view. That's all I can do. Uh, Jared Vester says, I think DC's The Question has the most potential to be a great cinematic movie. A detective noir style and tone would be cool. Yeah. You know, I like The Question. I think back when they first introduced him in the 80s, I really love what they did. With the question, I, I, I recently realized that there's an om, a question omnibus, and um, and uh, I, I need to get that because I loved those issues. They were great. Ian S. says, hey, Rob, how do you watch region-blocked Blu-rays in the U.S.? Because I see you get U.K. Blu-rays often, so how do you watch them? Thanks. Good question, Ian. I have two uh, uh, 4K disc players. One is a dedicated multi-region player. You can get various iterations of multi-region players that play everything. And I have a, I have two. I've got a pan. My primary Blu-ray 4K disc player is a Panasonic player. It's uh, Region A, which is our region. And then I have a Sony, a dedicated Sony multi-region player that plays discs from uh, Europe. And so that's. Um, that's how I play my multi-region discs. So I don't even, I don't even, um, um, I don't even think about it. Like for instance, uh, I'll give you a, a preview of um, of uh, a disc I got that I haven't shown yet. That um, that it'll, it'll be on. Let's get physical media. So here you go. Uh, this is a brand new restoration from. Is this Studio Canal? It is. Uh, this is Franz Kafka's The Trial. It is the 60th anniversary restoration. Uh, Anthony Perkins is in this. So this is, oh, you can see that. That is a, um, a British 4K. And I believe this is region B. No, no, actually, this is, this is region free, so I could play. Most 4K discs are region free. But some, like Studio Canal's The Doors, I believe is region locked. So 
Um, but yeah, I have two. I have two players. You have to have a dedicated uh, player. But that's uh, that's a good question. Uh, Eric Skelton sends in a twenty dollars super chat. Thanks, man. As a dem. When I listen to Critical Drinker and like-minded allies shouting woke leftist or my favorite genocidal socialist when discussing movies, it seems obvious to me that they're hateful. They're as hateful as Trump and DeSantis. Well, see, I know I I, I hear a lot of that too, but but uh, I, I I haven't no knowing them. I I wouldn't say that they are, and I you know that's because I know them, but. I think, look, I do think that there is a lot of ideology on, on all sides. But, um, uh, and yeah, I mean, they're playing to a base for sure. Uh, but look, I mean, <laughs> as I was, I've been talking a lot about, I'm sure if you're on YouTube, you have seen the Vice um, feminist panel debating feminism. Man, is that an interesting, and all the different takes uh, man, was that an interesting watch? Because I'm like, wow, wh where's the actual panel on feminism I wanted to tune in to watch? Everybody, if you look at that panel, everybody wanted to talk about their own victimhood in whatever way, shape, or form they wanted to talk about it. And I'm like, where's the where's the debate on feminism? There were so many other off topic subjects brought in, and how everybody felt. It's this is the problem with with uh, I think discourse today, and. Um, I, you know, I, I think the, the, there's a lot of people who talk about in political circles and entertainment circles, talk about the leftist ideology. I think for me, I, I just, I don't, I like, I, I can't stand ill considered ideology. And I think we're just getting a lot of really stupid discourse. And I think ultimately, um, we need, we all need to be smarter and we all need to understand what it is that we're saying. And it's frustrating when you watch entertainment like to me Star Trek Discovery is um Star Trek Discovery is a is a is a terrible it's not just terrible Star Trek, it's terrible science fiction. Because they go a thousand years into the future and there's not one interesting thing about where where is mankind going to be in a thousand years? If you look at our technology now and extrapolate out, um where, where are we going to be? Are we going to be transhuman? Are, are we going to be half machine? Are we going to have nanotechnology that repairs our cells and our bodies so we can live to be four or 500 years? There's, there was nothing interesting about the, the human future portrayed in Discovery, but you do have people a thousand years from now still talking about their pronouns. And so when that happens, I think the, 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 the ideology, the ideas of ideology being thrown at these things is, or, or, or the, the criticisms using words like woke or leftist, I understand where they come from. Because when, when you have a space fairing, when you have a federation of planets where people are, inter, there's intermarriages between species from different planets, no one is going to care about your sexuality or your personal identity. Because a thousand years from now, um, we would have been so far beyond that, but the makers of current Star Trek have to actually have a scene. It used to be allegorical, uh, but now, no, you literally have a character correcting another character saying, oh, I, I need you to use my pronouns. And when you watch something like that in a science fiction show set in a thousand years in the future, it's it really is, it's irksome and angering, and it's also dumb. And it, it's, it, it, to me, what I, I you know, while I don't harp on those kinds of things, when I do see something like that, I'm like, one, the people that are making the show are idiots, and two, because there's where's the imagination? Where is the great thing about science fiction is it takes what we know about ourselves today, and ex, it extrapolates on where we might be in some future time, and 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 how are we going to get there? Why are we going to get there? Which is great, but when you have somebody bitching about their pronouns a thousand years from now. I mean, it, it, why not have a future where people, if they want it, like, what if there is a group of, if, if you're a thousand years from now, imagine with Star Trek technology, with medical technology, if I decided, and I would tell this story, if I decided that I wanted to live as a woman for a year, the technology would exist in um, a thousand years in the Star Trek future where I could literally, probably down to the DNA chromosomal level, it could probably turn you into a woman. 
Now, there's an interesting science fiction story. You know, you want to tell a, a story about trans rights or something. What if there were people a thousand years from now that could literally decide to be a different gender? And and they could do that pain-free and using that technology. And then where's that could be an interesting story. How would that work? And and how would that affect the civilization when you had people, whatever gender you were, uh, whatever biological sex you were born with, if you could change that sex and then live for a year as, and then go back? I mean, I, I don't know what the story you're going to tell in, in that context would be, but that's that's the kind of thing. If you want to address these issues, make a great allegorical science fiction story to do it. Don't have a character. I mean, that's terrible writing. It's didactic. It's stupid. I, I mean, a character talking about their pronouns a thousand years from now. I want to punch the screen. And I think that that's, that's where a lot of the political speak comes from, because how can you not look at that as anything but pandering? And, and to me, when I see something like that, I'm just, man, that's really uncreative. It's not good science fiction. And, um, but there's a lot of people that will, will call it for what it is in, in not necessarily elegant terms. And I understand where they're coming from. So, but I, I get where you're coming from too, Eric, because, um, although I don't think it's born out of hatred, I think it's born out of anger and frustration that we're being pandered to and by, by the very things that we love. And honestly, when the viewers are smarter, when we're smarter than the showrunners, or and I, I'm saying the storytellers, and the storytellers are talking down to us because who put who put them here? Here's the whole thing: great science fiction, great speculative fiction, science fiction, fantasy, and horror doesn't tell you how to think. It offers you scenarios and stories to ponder. Great stories do not tell you what to think. They give you something to think about. And the great stories set your imagination and your mind on fire. And they stick with you. And now we're getting stories that are just, well, I'd say fraudulent creations from fraudulent creators. And it's frustrating when you're expected to take all that. And when it happens a lot, um, it becomes apparent that our stories are compromised. And that's the thing that bothers me the most. And I think that's what I get from a lot of my fellow creators. So um, Dr. Jones says, the status quo is an agenda too, man. Well, I, yeah, but I, 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 the status quo, I've, I've, we, we, look, we always have to be moving, constantly evolving, constantly changing. I think the status quo should always be challenged all the time. But it has to be challenged in an effective manner. And just like fraudulent creators making movies and TV, if you're going to challenge the status quo, be a disruptor or whatever, by all means, do it. But do it to the best of your ability. I mean, here's what I can't stand. People that want to go burn down our cities, but then they don't have anything to replace them with. It's like, yeah, man, anarchy. Let's Okay, well, once the city's burned down, how are you then going to step in and create this new world? And that's the thing that I find so annoying. Uh, in my own hometown of Seattle, when we were having the, the the chop, you had all these people that occupied part of Capitol Hill. And it's like, okay, it's really easy to occupy a city that already has infrastructure and you can use the bathrooms and the parks or whatever. But it's really hard to go out and say the wilderness and build a new world. And um, that's part of it too, I think. Uh, <laughs> oh, I love this. JDSCT says, I watched Fudo on your recommendation, bonkers. Um, <laughs> Takashi Miyake, uh, you, you, uh, Takashi Miyake, I think it's Miyake, how you pronounce it. I've never known how to pronounce this. Please, some Japanese person correct me on how to pronounce his name. Um, Fudo is a movie about a high school crime boss. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. Uh, it is bonkers. And how much fun is that movie? <laughs> Just watch it. Uh, you'll enjoy it. Did you watch it on a double bill with Ichi the Killer? <laughs> Tom Jr. Jackson uh, says, hey, Bobby B, good to see you. How's it going, Tom? Uh, Tom, who's the, the, he's the goof emeritus around these parts. Um, uh, where do I get my 4K protector cases? Oh, for those of... 
So my 4K discs, um, I put in these hard, it's like hard plastic cases to protect them. And uh, I know it's kind of anal, but uh, I like that. And uh, so, for instance, like, you know, when you've got uh, a steel book, you don't want the steel book to get scratched or anything. So it's good to have these protective cases. I just, uh, I get them from Amazon. Uh, they are, uh, uh, they're like, what are they? 30 bucks for 25, I think. And, um, they're fun. They're good. Uh, you might, you know what? I can probably hang on a second. I, I'll, I will go and hang on. I will get the, I'll get the actual link from Amazon right now and I'll put it in the live chat, uh, because they're great and I love them. As a matter of fact, so they come, it's, it's pretty cool when they come, uh, they come like this. This is how they come. And then you kind of have to fold them open um, because they come flat. And you you fold them open and then put the flaps down. But hang on. Let me um, me go and uh, get them. Let me go look at my orders. And I will put the link in. What? Wow, I am missing. War Games was delivered... I, I, where did where did that go? It must be I have to go find my war games. Um, <laughs> it was delivered almost a week ago, and I haven't seen it. Um, so here is the uh, these are the this here's the link to these cases. So you can go get those at Amazon if you so desire. There it is in the live chat. So there you go. Um, so there we go. Um, and Eric Skelton says, based on your recommendation, I watched that Vice episode. <laughs> I was lost. And I'm a political science major who had no idea what trans that a transactual feminism was. It was terrible. I mean, it was a it was a really, really bad um uh display. And it was really frustrating because I thought that they had some people on the panel that I thought were great people. And they, um, they, uh, they, uh, it was bad. It was just, it was, and you know what? I I mean, it was so weird because no one, everybody wanted to just spew their agenda and they didn't want to have a real conversation. It was frustrating to watch. Uh, Sonny Dominguez sends in a tip and says, have you seen the Tim Robbins, Russell Brand conversation about modern ideologies and politics behaving like religion? Totally did. It was a great conversation. People are dogmatic, proclaim absolutes, and condemn others who don't believe like they do. Hollywood used to push back against such zealotry. Oh, I I think you're absolutely right. I love that conversation. I'd highly recommend it. Uh, Tim Robbins speaking with Russell Brand. It was a great conversation. I mean, this is what I love about YouTube is that we, we, have, these, we have these conversations happening, which I think is uh, fantastic. Um, yeah, it's great to watch. But yeah, the, we're, I think we're going to see that pushback because the problem is the the discourse and the zealotry, it's just not that smart. You know, all of these, the, the things that people are screaming and, and crying about, um, the level of discourse. I mean, you, you go back and you watch some of the people like William F. Buckley or watch some of the great conservative thinkers. And I'm not even a conservative, but when you go back and you watch these people, if you go back and look up interviews on YouTube of people having debates in the 60s or 70s or something, um, you realize how far we've fallen as far as our intellectual discourse or intellectual inquiry is concerned. And it, it's it's really frustrating because when you try and have a, sub- a substantive conversation with somebody, most people are ill-equipped to have that conversation. That vice conversation about feminism was case in point. It was um, It was not good. It was not good. The lovely Connie Sang. Hello, Connie. I've missed you. Hi, Rob. You're missed. We have so much to catch up on. I can't believe you're in my neck of the woods last week. What movie did you watch? Oh, I, I was in. Okay, I went to the Burbank 16, and I met my friend Dave uh, Hargrove, one of my oldest friends in L.A., and we went and saw Avatar, Way of Water, but I wanted to see it in a Dolby cinema to see which I like better, the IMAX presentation or the Dolby 3D presentation. And... um uh, I the Dolby the Dolby one wins uh, in terms of the presentation, 
But yes, I you are missed as well, Connie. Um, I miss our conversations. We we must get together. We must uh, chat. We, we, you know, there are these things, these newfangled contraptions called phones. We should talk. <laughs> um, and we will. And uh, yes, we should absolutely do that. Now, I have another letter to read. And um, I would like to read it. The, the third of the letter. Third of the letters I wanted to read. This one comes from Joe Panora. And Joe, his subject headline is The Silliness on Twitter. Hello, thy metal one. I saw the silliness on Twitter, and I just find it odd that someone would ever describe you as a racist. I've never heard of this Matt Jarbo before, and it would be sad for someone to try and sully your name in the hopes of relevancy or clicks. What I see in that picture posted on Twitter is a group of guys with differing opinions from varying backgrounds coming together over a love of film. When the weak flippantly throw words around like racist, bigot, or Nazi to describe someone they don't agree with, whom have never spouted such hatred, it diminishes the impact and severity of those words. If everything is racist, then nothing is racist, which may cause a blind eye to the true evil festering in the hearts of those who wish to divide. The poor, misguided person trying to sully your name by using the word racist so cavalierly does more harm misusing the English language than the backwards people spouting racism. We as a global community outright cast out such beliefs of bigotry. However, those who insincerely label people as such are trying to rob the voices and unjustly add a stigma to people they do not like. Those are the actions of cowards, gaslighting for acceptance by peers in the name of the same wretched cloth. In closing, your excitement for Picard Season 3 has got me as excited as Scotty beaming whales onto a bird of prey. If it's Terry Trek now, at least the at, at the very least there needs to be an RMB named planet in the Federation. That would be metal. Yeah, you know I'm I'm wearing my uh, underneath my sweatshirt. I got my Terry Trek shirt on, um, which I love. Thank you to the Popcast guys for making it. They also made me a Terry Trek hat. Um, so there you go. Um, but yeah, you know, look, it's such a weird, it's such a weird thing, uh, to, uh, for, uh, you know, people are going to call you what they're going to call you. You just have to, you just have to deal with it. And, uh, I just thought it was cheap. It was, what's really interesting is the idea that, that I'm meeting fellow, first of all, first and foremost, we're fellow YouTube pundits. We all work in the same space and we all hung out together and, uh, it, it was a fun night and for somebody to the, then cast dispersions on it on us because we went to a i mean we went to a star wars burlesque show i'm sure somebody would be like well that's also very objectifying and hey man i didn't make the show but um it certainly was fun to go uh jared snyder says oh first of all josh lecount says i was a production coordinator for a roger lay jr film he's a really good guy we talked a lot of trek on set as well small world uh josh i love roger lay jr roger lay and i spent three years together doing star trek documentaries roger is a very capable no nonsense person there's no bullshitting in him at all i would imagine that um he was a great producer and probably made sure everybody had what they needed. And um, that's great that you work with him. I, I have the utmost respect for Roger, and I think he's terrific. And, you know, he has been trying to get a Captain Power series. It was it was, it was was close. He was working with the Reeve Stevens. He had a great script. If you talk to him, tell him Rob Burnett said to ask you about Phoenix Rising. If he hasn't, talk to you about it already. But he's a great guy, Josh. I'm glad you had a good experience working for him. Jared Snyder says, hi, Rob. Have you had a chance to read Frederick Douglass, my man Frederick, right there, um, Prophet of Freedom. It won the Pulitzer Prize. Great book. Happy New Year. No. But since I'm on Amazon, I'll go get that right now. <coughs> um, that's amazing. I'm a big fan. Uh, Frederick Douglass is one of my <coughs> uh, historical heroes. Um he was one of the great American statesmen and orator. Uh, he was, the guy was amazing. 
and uh, I'm a huge fan. But that is the, exactly the kind of book I would love to read. I didn't know that that book existed. I've got to go find that. Got to go find that book. Um, so yeah, but I wanted to say thank you for Joe for writing writing this in. I mean, it's so funny. Like, I mean, I do stream with people of color every week. It's like, I, and I'm Jewish, so it's it's very funny having all these things thrown at me. And I'm like, obviously, you don't know me, you don't watch my channel, but it's really. I'll tell you something. It's really easy to to paint people with broad strokes. <clears throat> it's not it's not cool. Wait, I think there's a spider in my drink. But yeah, I don't like that. So um yeah, it's bad. Um so anyway, you know, here's the thing. I mean, back to the I really am excited ultimately about 2023 to be a science fiction, fantasy and horror fan. We are getting some great shit that I'm excited about. And I think that's, uh, you know, at this point in my life, I'm really excited about the movies that we're getting. Coppola is making Megalopolis. He sold his vineyards, paying for it himself like he did when he made Apocalypse Now. I'm sure what we're going to get amazing. I can't wait. I can't wait. David Fincher has the killer coming out. You know, the movie with Michael Fassbender as like an assassin. David Fincher's, come on, man. And then we're getting the Marvel movies. We're getting four DC films. Uh, there's so much cool stuff coming on, coming out. The, all the great filmmakers, Ridley Scott's Napoleon movie is going to come out. There's a, ama- uh, I can't wait to see that Evil Dead Rises trailer tomorrow. Or pardon me, Evil Dead Rise. A new Evil Dead movie? Come on. I mean, so, and Star Trek Picard season three, um, loved it. And uh, there's so much good stuff. And I think that we, um, we should, we should be excited about it. You know, uh, very excited about it. <clears throat> um, Brian Jonestown says the living daylights is a masterpiece. Timothy Dalton is criminally underappreciated thoughts. My fellow bond lover love from Korea. Not only that, I'm a huge Living Daylights fan. Uh, came out in 1987. It was the last John Barry scored Bond film. Um, he he brought in elect you know electronic electronic drums and things. I'm a huge Living Daylights fan. I don't particularly love the Aha song, and I'm a fan of Aha, but I know that John Barry and Aha didn't get along. But and the Pretender song, you know, where has everybody gone? It's so good. Um, and If There Was a Man, two Pretender songs. So good. Uh, it's great. I love Living Daylights. And it's got it's got a pretty great plot. You've got a great uh, Aston Martin in that movie with, come on, on the ice. It's great. Better than that fucking Ice Palace bullshit and Die Another Day. And it's got a great climax. I, uh... Uh, and it's got uh, Jerome Crabbe. It's got uh, uh, John Rhys Davies. <laughs> I mean, it's great. It's got that guy who later went on to be the German terrorist and Die Hard, who plays Necros. No, Living Daylight rules. I, I'm a big fan, uh, especially you know coming on the heels of A View to a Kill in '85, which I hated. I hated View to a Kill. Hated it. Um. So yeah, didn't like it. <laughs> But I'm a fan of Living Daylights. It's really good. I loved Timothy Dalton as Bond. I do not like License to Kill very much. You know, they shot most of it in Mexico. They wanted to keep the budget down. And it feels to me like it's a Miami Vice episode. Robert Davi did a great job, but it's just, it just, it didn't feel like a Bond movie. You know, I think it could have been much better. Um... Thomas Logan says, Happy New Year, Rob. God bless you for keeping it real. On that note, will you ever bring back the Jarbo stream? Can you share why it's gone? Yeah, I'll tell you. You know what? I'll tell you something. Wasn't proud of that. Wasn't proud of my reaction to Matt Jarbo. And um, uh, I shouldn't have, you know, I went off and bitched and moaned and complained. And frankly, I was a little embarrassed. So I just 86 the stream. (laughs) I did because I didn't. Like, I gave in to that, and I didn't want, 
I didn't want that to be. I know some people clipped out things and did took me, and I, you know they they use that and made some videos, which is fine. I just felt that, and to be honest, said uh, she said to me, maybe you shouldn't, maybe you should not private. She privatized this stream for me, and she said maybe get rid of that stream. And I, you know what, I went back and looked at some of it, and I'm like, yeah, I'll get rid of it because I didn't. It was really weird. I mean, I don't usually respond to those things. I'm like, hey, say what you want to me. Um, but that, I, 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 I thought that that was not my best. It was not my finest hour. So I decided to get rid of it. And I did. Uh, the Richard, our friend, the Richard. Aloha, Rob. Haoli. Uh, mak, uh, makahiki. Who? Happy New Year in Hawaiian. Oh, I did a terrible job of that. 2023 is the year of manifestation. Dreams do come true. Love and aloha to all the post-geek singularity. Well, thank you, the Richard, and I've very much enjoyed your missives <clears throat> over message messenger, so thank you for that. I also told Elizabeth uh, that you said hello. <coughs> Sheriff Carl says, one of the great joys of life is our ability to travel and meet people who are different, to have discussions, debates, share experiences that are uniquely our own and those that are more universal. I don't get why people only want to hear what they agree with. Sheriff Carl, I couldn't agree more. Uh, one of my favorite things in life is to travel. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I need, I keep meaning to do this. I've got the paperwork right there. This is my Toomey passport holder with my passport in it and my vaccination card. I need to get my passport renewed. And I keep taking it with me everywhere because... I got to send it in <clears throat> because why Tango Shalom is opening in Germany in the summer and I want to go, I want to go to Germany. <clears throat> so I want to, um, I, I need it. I need my passport renewed. Uh, Jared Vester says, what do you think will be the first DC other world movie that Gunn has planned? I mean, that's a really good question. Boy, that's so, that topic is so broad. I don't think it's going to be, you know what would be cool though? And I was thinking about this. What if they made Red Sun with Henry Cavill? <laughs> Could they do that? I mean, I know it's a crazy idea, but it'd be cool though. <laughs> I don't know if they'll do it, but... If I was James Gunn and I had control, I mean, obviously they have to build their universe, but what wouldn't that be badass to do Red Sun with Henry Cavill as the Russian Superman? I mean, I know a lot of people might go, no, but I think it would be cool. <coughs> anyway, I mean, I really do. I think that would be, I think it would be a lot of fun to do that. Um, <laughs> I don't know if they will, but... Um, <laughs> be good but other than that I'm really I mean if it's true and we hear about what they're going to do I can't wait to hear what they're going to do to be honest I honestly can't wait I'm really excited uh, Boney Joseph says Boney Joseph says hey Rob love your voice well Boney thank you for that For All Mankind is one of my favorite shows my god you and me both Boney you and I park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay do you think the show can go beyond the solar system in its upcoming seasons? That is a good question. I don't think so. Only because, you know, it's it's it, it's keeping relatively realistic about available technology. I think it would be too much of a leap to have. I mean, it's still going to take, you're not going to have faster than light travel. So I think it's only going to be set in this solar system. Although I could see them in the final season jumping, you know, 100 or 200 years or 500 years into the future and they end the whole series with, say, some kind of a generational sleeper ship arriving at a new solar system, you know, in Proxima Centauri or something. I, I can see the show, the show ending that way, which I think it would be, uh, would be cool. If they did that. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, that'd be cool. 
I mean, I, now that now that you put the idea in my my head, I I'm gonna be obsessed with that. And see if they do that. By the way, if you guys want to watch a really great, I mean, people say it's more like Avenue Five, which I can't stand, but there's a Swedish science fiction film called Anara. It's A N I A R A Anara. Um, I loved it. It's great. It's pretty depressing, but it's really great. And if you like space movies, watch Anara. It's just about some people that want to relocate from Earth to Mars and it didn't quite work out that way. <laughs> but check it out. Um, Jedediah Elias says, Hey, Rob, given the state of fandom title for the live stream, wanted to mention the incredible speech you gave on the John Campia show about Adam Aaron and the movie theater industry. Great stuff. Jedediah, that's very nice of you to say. Um, I don't know when I gave that speech, but uh, I appreciate you saying so. By the way, I think we should all go buy Cineworld stock at four and a half cents and make it a meme stock. <laughs> make some money. I need money for my Hot Toys budget for 2023. They just announced a bunch of, they're going to do a 40th anniversary Return of the Jedi lineup. Oh, what am I going to do? Don't know. But uh, um, it would be certainly fun. Uh, Sheriff Carl says, nice, I'm going back to Scandinavia for six weeks next Tuesday. Let the drunken discourse games begin. Uh, well, congratulations, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool that you're going there. That's uh, most excellent. I wish I could go, but I, I need, that's why I'm worried. I need to get my passport renewed. Well, listen, everyone, kind souls, gentle beings, uh, I'm going to end this stream, this sort of impromptu stream I want to thank you all for being here. As always, I want to thank you for your generous support of this channel via Super Chats and tips and memberships and all of that. You know, I never say like and subscribe. I guess I should say that because, look, I'm 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 eking up to 50,000. I mean, look, I look at people like Paul Chatto. That guy's rocking it. But he's he's I've been doing this for four years now. Uh, this is year five. This channel has gone into year five on the channel. And I, I, I really I, I really want to. uh I really want that hundred thousand, you know, YouTube plaque. <laughs> just, to, I just, it's it's become a life goal. Um, <laughs> uh, Jared Vester says, "Do we discover aliens first, or do we discover everything about our ocean first? Well, I think we should be doing both. I think that everything we're learning about our our oceans and the things the deeper we go, you know, it, it's interesting. If there is life, is if there are oceans under the ice." On Jupiter's like in 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 Celis in Celis, um, or Io or anything like that, and there's there's a geothermal heat that has kept those oceans warm, and maybe there's life in those oceans. The more we know about our own oceans, will help us out. I mean, we're gonna I don't know if I'll see it in my lifetime, but we're we're gonna start exploring. There's gonna be we're gonna send robot probes to like Europa or Io or in Celis. Uh, I, it's going to be really interesting, but I think that we we really need to discover more about our planet. So I think that discovery um, it, it should all happen together and concurrently because one will inform the other. So I think we should do both. To be honest, well, everyone, I will be back on the John Campia show tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow's Wednesday, along with Chris Carr and uh, Jonathan and Ray and Taylor and uh, all that. We got the Evil Dead Rise trailer dropping in the morning, or maybe it's dropped tonight. I don't know. Very excited for that. Um, so, yeah. But again, I want to thank my moderating staff. I want to thank Tom Jr. Jackson for being here. I know I didn't even tell him. I just started this. So, Tom, you're a goof person, and thanks for being here. Um, hope you're feeling better. And, uh, yeah. I got to call Fernando Borrero and see how he's doing. Get him on the show. And on that note, everyone, remember, <clears throat> every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. So for you imagination connoisseurs, I will only say this. <laughs> have a better night. <laughs>